mentioned while well, I was still sort of on the China subject, interestingly, and <clears throat> there's been a lot of chat about this, the lack of the ability to arbitrage up to 120 buck per ounce premiums. And that's understandable. But <clears throat> I think what's important to understand here, two things going on, really. Um, you've got um, the, the COMEX <clears throat> siloed market where it is designed to suppress the price of gold. And you've got the Chinese market, which have incentivized in two tranches, 2010, buy gold. And, and funnily enough, when they said that, it never dipped below that price. They kept the, the they, they guaranteed that price, essentially. And then just a few months ago, um, opening up to the general population, uh, whereas before in 2010, we were talking about people who could afford to buy bullion bars. And it was really about that. And then suddenly you t- you're opening up the guy who can click on a mouse and buy a gram or two and invest. And and the uh, the the incentive that China said, and this is only, what, three months ago, hmm. said, look, <clears throat> and gold was trading at $2,000 an ounce at this point in, in equivalent terms. And they said, this is the reason to buy this is because of the price, the gold price appreciation you will receive. But there's a circle within a circle here. And I think what they're trying to do is certainly on the the fact is we've seen them openly talking about preparing their country for war. And and that would be very um, pragmatic of them, given some of the stuff that's going on. Um, But also to encourage um, these people to buy uh, uh, the general population now to also buy gold. Then what? Yeah, and you're also saying, essentially saying, it won't go below that price because if you're saying that you'll 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 get the gold price appreciation, so what we're seeing is really that is going on. They will limit the amount of gold, if necessary, that can uh, enter that market. So you've got the COMEX siloing it down, and they siloing it up, and but the amount of gold that's being bought is actually tapping into just one single global supply. So regardless of it being not able to be arbitraged directly, essentially it's having a massive impact. Now, I think two things that come off that is I was going to ask you, and then then I want to go over to Moscow, what we're seeing in Moscow. But I guess really I'm, I'm of the opinion, uh, my friend Nigel Farage is of the same opinion, um, and many people I speak to are of the opinion that if China is going to uh, um, repatriate or invade to Taiwan, whichever you want to call it, um, they would need to do it before Trump was elected. And so um, because I don't think I think Trump might be a little bit more of a, an aggressive figure, uh, I think most people think, you know, to be honest, if you if you've got a window of opportunity, uh, it's while Biden is um, uh, post Afghanistan, uh, the, the inability for uh, US to over to destroy Russia, uh, direct confrontation with Russia, um, it, it is they're losing credibility. So you kind of wonder what what's your opinion? And I really love your opinion on this because some people think it's going to happen. Yeah. Do you think it'll happen? And obviously, could this be a reason they're uh, building gold reserves ahead of obvious sanctions that would come? Well, um, I mean, obviously, we will see in time. Um, But I take a slightly different view. The longer term uh, objective of China is to reabsorb Taiwan. But that is essentially a long term objective. And I think it's an objective which the Chinese would hope to achieve with... um, you know, may, maybe persuasion of various sorts uh, rather than invasion. They will have watched uh, what happened in the Ukraine and seen the difficulties of um, invading a country which is determined to defend itself. I mean, when you get the citizens defending themselves, you know, that's the sort of hedgehog approach or the porcupine approach, you know, where, you know, you attack the porcupine and suddenly you find, okay, you know, <laughs> You may be able to attack it, but you get lots of quills thrown at you in the process. You know, it's actually not that viable. And they've also got the further disadvantage that you've got this channel between, you know, the, 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 the sea channel between them and the island. And that, I think, basically rules out um, uh, a military objective uh, as, as a, you know, 
as as the preferred choice, and I think it rules it out also as a preemptive uh, activity. It just wouldn't work. So um, I, I think I would discount that. Now, if I was President Xi, I think after all the saber rattling and all the rest of it, I think probably what I would do is I would um, call a summit with the guys in Taiwan. Um, you know, maybe not quite a presidential eleven level to begin with, but I would say to them, you know, come on, chaps, look, you know, we're all the same ethnic background. Let's work together, um, and we won't invade you. We'll give you that guarantee. I mean, it's just a very long term objective that we want to work together. That's you know, let's mm-hmm. let's let's just concentrate on that. And then, of course, that opens up all the Taiwanese technology to China immediately. What does America do? Oh my God! This has gone away from us. Help! <laughs> mm. so I think there's, I, that would be my approach if I was President Xi. Now, he's probably cleverer than me, so he may not do it. I don't. <laughs> well, I, he does walk around with the art of war in his back pocket, by all accounts. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, wisely so. In which case, he will have read. Um, uh, the art of war, that uh, the last thing you do is go and invade a place like Taiwan. I mean, Absolutely. Just no, just you're right. Yeah. Really interesting, Alistair, that, you know, these are, these, are, these are really the kind of things we need to be thinking about. You know? So um, it makes more sense what you're so- talking about. It makes far more sense. Uh, China doesn't have to th- react immediately to anything other than they, they get invaded. But... Um, but yeah, I mean, these things, I mean, they'll think a thousand years. Exactly. It's not their style. I mean, when they absorbed Hong Kong, that was as a result of direct threats by America yeah. against Hong Kong uh, and their intelligence. And we know this because it's publicly available, but their intelligence uh, warned them uh, of the, um, you know, the student riots were being provoked by uh, American intelligence agencies back in 2014. They knew all this. They forecast it. They, you know, the intelligence guys forecast this. Um, and, uh, you know, it didn't happen immediately, but it happened that autumn. So, um, you know, they they understand the Americans' game. Um, and, uh, you know, they rather take the view that America is fundamentally weak. Um, it hasn't actually got control over its own politics. Um, and therefore, they can afford to just take the Confucius uh, line, you know, we're around, we've been around. I mean, Confucius was what, 500 BC in our mm-hmm. time? And, yeah. uh, you know, ever since, what have they done? They've just sort of gone with the flow. Everybody else makes the mistakes and um, they just defend themselves from those mistakes. And I cannot see that China's thinking is going to change from there. I mean, it's, it, it is interesting because the one thing that she has done is he has jumped down on all the corruption uh, which existed beforehand. And he's done this in such a way, you know, when we look at the West and we think, this is brutal, this is terrible. And, uh, you know, the treatment of Uyghurs. I mean, that only came into the headlines when Trump started promoting it. This is why you shouldn't like the Chinese. You know, mm. so, you know I think one's got to have, um, you know, you've got to sort of stand back from this and take a, a you know, a more general view. Uh, and, um, you know, I... It's rather like, you know, looking at the sort of debt situation. I mean, in the West, there's so many people who say, well, you know, China's going to go belly up, bust, whatever, and they've got a property crisis. Da, da, da. They can handle it all. You know, mm-hmm. it never got, really got out of control. It got a bit extreme, yeah, but they can handle it all. And, you know, the key behind this, uh, and it, the key is that they have got, second to Singapore, the highest savings rate in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's it's always an approximate figure because it's uh you know you you, you take um you know two elements of GDP work out the difference and that's your savings rate, but China has a savings rate of around about forty percent and what that means is that people put aside forty percent of their money um, for the future and this gives um, an incredible level of stability to prices. I mean the rate of inflation uh, by CPI in China is zero. But of course, that worries all the Keynesian economists. Oh, you know, it's going to sink into deflation. I mean, what a load of rubbish. They know what they're doing. It's actually a very good economy. And, uh, you know, central government borrowing isn't, I mean, you know, they haven't got anywhere near the levels of us Westerners. Um, 
I think from memory, because I haven't looked at this recently, but I think from memory, you know, sort of government borrowing is something like 40% of GDP or outstanding debt is 40% of GDP, something like that. Obviously, there's also uh, a problem with um, uh, local um, regional authorities, as it were, but um, they're trying to centralize everything, which may or may not be a good thing economically, but, you know, um, they've got control over things. And, uh, you know, by and large, if as an individual in China, you keep yourself out of politics, I mean, you can do what you want. This is, you know, this is the reality of it. And it's a reality that we've rather lost sight of in our own countries. 